1993, the Game Boy was still dominating handheld gaming, despite its increasingly aged tech. Tetris was still a mainstay for most, and games like Super Mario Land 2 and Kirby's Dream Land were recent hits. And after the release of A Link to the Past on Super Nintendo in 1991, Takashi Tezuka got a Game Boy Zelda title greenlit for development. In truth, Tezuka had been working on such a game for years, with a Zelda game engine being the first thing he worked on when the Game Boy launched. He and a small group of colleagues had been moonlighting on that pet project right under the higher-ups' noses. Once development officially began, the plan was to make a Game Boy port of A Link to the Past, but this quickly shifted into an original project instead with a story inspired by one striking concept. A giant egg atop a mountain that would, upon hatching, bring about the end of the world. When you think of first-party Nintendo games, especially those of the 2D era, the story isn't likely to be the first thing to come to mind. Mario is almost entirely gameplay-driven, and any plot is just there to serve as window dressing. Metroid is inspired by alien sci-fi, but those games instead focus on building a strong sense of atmosphere through clever and intuitive world design. But if there's one series where it feels like Nintendo has always been more willing to tell actual stories, it's The Legend of Zelda. By 1991, the series had seen a trilogy of games, the last of which in particular acquainting audiences more with the franchise's traditional setting, the Kingdom of Hyrule. At the same time, though, A Link to the Past could almost be described as simply a more fleshed-out Zelda 1. Now, that's an oversimplification that doesn't do either game their proper justice, but the fact of the matter is that by game number 3, Zelda stories, while bulkier than the typical Nintendo fare, weren't particularly varied. Somewhat unexpectedly, it would be the franchise's Game Boy debut, Link's Awakening, that would place special focus on storytelling. Allegedly taking place after A Link to the Past, although who really knows at this point, Nintendo treats the Zelda timeline like silly putty, Link's Awakening sees Link caught in a storm while traveling the seas, eventually shipwrecked on Koholint Island, where he is found by a girl named Marin and her father Tarin, residents of Maid Village. Link is eventually told that the only way to leave the island is to collect the eight instruments of the sirens and wake the windfish, which lies sleeping in a giant egg resting atop Koholint's huge Mount Tomaranch. But he is also warned that doing so could somehow be devastating to Koholint Island. From the outset, Link's Awakening sets itself apart by breaking away from the usual recurring Zelda story elements. There is no Hyrule, no Ganon, no Triforce, not even Zelda herself. The team behind the game did this on purpose, as this allowed writer, Yoshiaki Koizumi, to spread his creative wings and not limit himself to a checklist of obligatory plot beats. Whereas previous games' character interactions were largely objectives rather than actual narrative, Link's Awakening places special focus on the player's interactions with the inhabitants of Koholint Island. Link returns to Mabe Village repeatedly throughout the game, and NPC dialogue will continually change to reflect the current state of Link's quest, and to comment on what's transpired in the plot. This means that characters will react to Link's actions in unique ways. For instance, while Mabe Village's shopkeeper will usually stop you from leaving without paying, if you do manage to slip out while his back is turned, every character will call Link Thief for the rest of the game, and should you ever return to the shop, the owner will kill you then and there. Actions meet consequences. Another thing that makes Link's Awakening stand out is its quirky sense of humor. NPCs will explain game mechanics, as is pretty standard, but then will immediately break the fourth wall by admitting that they have no idea what they're saying. One character will introduce himself to Link only to then inform him that he'll be stuck in the mountains later and to keep an eye out for him. A character named Alrira will give the player hints whenever they contact him from one of various telephone booths, but should the player ever visit him in person, the man is too cripplingly shy to speak. You could find a joke about the internet in there somewhere. It also features a plethora of Nintendo cameos. Tarin definitely seems to be based on Mario, but we also have obvious appearances from Mario's Goombas, Piranha Plants, and Chain Chomps, and... Is that... Kirby? Oh, yeah, that, that's Kirby. Princess Peach even makes an appearance during a side plot about Dr. Wright from SimCity, here called Mr. Wright, get it, being catfished. 
Damn, this game really was ahead of its time on internet satire, huh? Given the original plan for Link's Awakening to be a port of Link to the Past, gameplay does largely feel like a Game Boyified version of the previous game. Surface level progression is the same in that you clear dungeons to obtain the quest items needed to finish the game, and bosses also follow the previous game's habit of requiring the current dungeon's secret item in order to defeat. But there are a lot of small and subtle changes made to that formula that add up to make this experience feel almost brand new. Most obviously is that Link's Awakening allows the player to substitute their sword for a different piece of equipment if they so choose. Since the Super Nintendo had four face buttons and the Game Boy only had two, the Game Boy Zelda lets the player equip any item to either button, and certain combinations of items can be used in tandem by doing this. Perhaps most commonly is the Pegasus Boots Dash combined with using the new Rock's Feather to jump so as to cross wide gaps. The overworld is also more clearly segmented than A Link to the Past was, perhaps to be expected for a handheld entry. Dungeon order is almost entirely linear in this one, and that's because certain areas of the world map are clearly cordoned off until you retrieve certain items from the dungeons. Early on, you'll need to find the power bracelet to be able to lift heavy stones in your path, then bombs, then the flippers, the hookshot, etc, etc. This makes Link's Awakening possibly one of the simplest Zelda games to clear without a guide. Once you understand which obstacles require which tools, the world map becomes fairly simple to figure out. Not to mention, the game feels the need to repeat tutorial blurbs every single time you interact with one of those obstacles, or every single time you pick up one of the game's temporary power-up items. Yeah, this game could definitely use some minor improvements to cut down on this stuff. Not only is it annoying to have to cancel out of every repeating text box because you brushed up against one pixel of a rock for a second, but those power-up items replace the in-game music with a very short recurring loop that can go on for minutes on end depending on how long you go without getting hit. Speaking of the overworld, the literal world map has been improved. Link's map is laid out in a screen-by-screen -screen grid that's filled in as he explores new areas. Viewing the map will allow you to look up specific locations by navigating each square, making it easy to remember where certain shops, dungeons, and NPCs are, which is a smart move for a game on a black and white console where an unmarked map could just end up looking like a blurry mess. As Link's quest goes on, he'll gain access to various warp points scattered across the map to streamline backtracking. Although, I feel the game could have benefited from having one or two more of these. These ones seem a bit too spread out if you ask me. In Dungeons, the compass has been improved. As well as pointing out chest locations like in the prior game, it also lets out a little jingle whenever the current room holds a key. Which is useful because not every key is obtained from chests. New stone slabs in each dungeon can also be tracked down, which are used to read from stone tablets that can often provide hints on clearing puzzles. Dungeons also seem a bit less complicated than those in A Link to the Past, but are no less dense in the long term. I'm pretty sure there was only one dungeon that featured multiple floors, for instance, and said dungeon features a unique objective wherein you have to carry an orb to four different locations and use it to knock down support pillars to collapse the floor above you. Another dungeon has multiple possible solutions to navigate, and as such even contains a spare key to prevent the player from getting softlocked should they take a less efficient path. New collectibles were added to the game in form of secret seashells, which are hidden in various locations and grant a sword upgrade upon collecting 20 of them. The magic meter from A Link to the Past did not return in this one, and so the magic powder item is now simply a refillable consumable item like bombs or arrows. This lack of a magic meter also means the fire rod is now essentially a third sword upgrade, but considering the rod isn't obtained until the game's final dungeon, this isn't as broken as it may sound. Link's Awakening also saw the debut of the traditional Zelda trading quest, wherein the player takes part in a chain of item exchanges through various NPCs that ultimately ends in obtaining a powerful new weapon. In this case, it results in the acquisition of the Boomerang, which here acts as a secret super weapon effective against most every enemy in the game. There's even a fishing minigame, which would become another semi-recurring element in the series. And reportedly, this minigame was put in by one of the programmers even though nobody asked him to. He just really liked fishing and wanted it in the game. The English version of Link's Awakening did see some mild censorship, but nothing too egregious. In Japan, this mermaid would refuse to breach the water because she had lost her top, but the English version changed the item into a lost pendant instead. 
And as a kid, I always wondered what this hippo lady's problem was, but I learned that in the Japanese version, she was posing nude for this painter and would cover herself up whenever Link entered the room. The American version just kind of scrubbed that clean, but I doubt anyone has really broken up about it. Throughout the course of the game, Link forms a bond with Marin, who dreams of seeing the world outside her island and grows fond of Link. As to her, he represents the thing she wants more than anything else. Freedom. She sees her isolated life on Koholint Island as a suffocating one, and confides in Link that she wishes she could just become a seagull and fly away. And indeed, the isolated nature of Koholint Island is brought to the foreground in a foreboding way. At first, the NPCs admitting that they don't know what they're saying comes off as a silly gag, but as the bit goes on, eventually you come to realize it's a lot deeper than just a meta joke from the writers. The inhabitants of Mabe Village start to reveal that they don't know anything about the history of the island, or even how long they've lived there. The very thought that anything may exist outside its shores even begins to cause them migraines. As Link collects the instruments of the sirens, he is repeatedly aided by this owl character, who, despite his willingness to point Link in the right direction, repeatedly warns him that accomplishing his goal could doom the island. Eventually, it's revealed that Koholint and everyone on it are manifestations of the Windfish's dream, and waking it would mean the island ceases to exist. As you near the end of the game, the dungeon bosses express their desire to stop you, not out of malice or aggression, but fear that Link will cause the end of their very existence. Yet Link knows he must leave the island, and so he presses on. Marin does not realize the true nature of the island other than a general sense of dread that something bad could happen should the Windfish awaken, but she chooses to aid Link regardless. Using the instruments, Link plays the Ballad of the Windfish taught to him by Marin to enter the Windfish's egg, fend off the nightmare that keeps it slumbering, and then watches as Koholint Island disappears, along with all the people there he'd come to know. Link suddenly wakes among the wreckage of his destroyed ship, wondering if it was all a dream. Then to see the windfish soaring the skies above him, along with a small flock of seagulls. The fact that this story exists at all is something of a wonder. Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto had very little to do with the making of Link's Awakening and as such the crew were left much to their own devices throughout its development. This is likely how they were able to use all those Nintendo cameos without much fuss, and moreover, Yoshiaki Koizumi has since mentioned in interviews that Miyamoto would almost certainly never let him make a game like this again. And yeah, in the grand scheme of Zelda, we've never quite gotten another game like this, Majora's Mask being the obvious exception, itself a game with a somewhat similar dev environment to this one. The type of story told in Link's Awakening was not common for games at the time, especially not first-party Nintendo games, which tended to be built around fun factor first and foremost, while any story was really just there to add flavor. Takashi Tezuka has said Link's Awakening was the first Zelda title to have a, quote, proper story. And yeah, it's the first of the franchise where I actually felt the story was worthy of highlight in one of these videos. This sort of bittersweet, ambiguous conclusion was wholly unexpected. If the player manages to finish the game with zero game overs, they'll receive a more clear-cut sign that at least one of the seagulls at the end was a reincarnated Marin, but otherwise the audience is led to believe they caused the end of these people's lives. Sure, those people were all just dreams, but they were dreams that Link was able to interact with and get to know as people, some of whom had real hopes and dreams of their own. And the moral ambiguity of what Link has done can really get the player thinking. We know Link would have to have left the island at some point, but could he have found another way? If we had tried a little harder, would Koholint still exist? Would leaving the Windfish in an eternal slumber be more humane than erasing all of Koholint from existence? Somehow, Link's Awakening did something once thought impossible. It used the much maligned trope ending of, it was all a dream, and actually made it work. And aside from just the game's ending, the story and setting of Link's Awakening is full of charm and a simple sort of beauty. One moment that sticks with me after all these years is a short quest where a ghost latches onto Link, asking him to go to the abandoned house on the Cape. Once inside, the ghost does nothing but take a look around, express a feeling of nostalgia that the house brings him, 
and then asks Link to escort him back to the graveyard. It dawns on you pretty clearly that this was the ghost's former home, and they just wanted one more look at the life they used to live before finally being put to rest. And the older I get, the more that sort of wistfulness resonates with me. The feeling of times long past that you can never reclaim, and accepting that those times are gone and that it's okay to move on. What a fucking beautiful game. <laughs>